Good afternoon and welcome to Food Biz Plus, our monthly webinar featuring innovators and entrepreneurs from the food industry. I am Will Rosenzweig, your host. I'm the Dean of the Food Business School at the Culinary Institute of America. The Food Business School is the graduate and executive uh, education uh, center at the CIA which is based in Hyde Park, New York, with campuses in San Antonio, and in uh, two in California here, where it is raining a lot today. And I am really uh, excited to have the opportunity to spend a little bit of time with Steve Case. Our um, objective in these conversations is to really illuminate the uh, kind of insights and processes that entrepreneurs bring to building and scaling businesses and we try to get to the heart of some of the key issues. Today it's going to be interesting to get a chance to talk with Steve who has had a prolific career as both an entrepreneur and an investor and is uh, recently published a really wonderful book called The Third Wave which uh, is like a way of sitting down with Steve and hearing um, wonderful kind of stories of his past. It's it's a bit autobiographical in a in a fun and nice way and then punctuated with I think key learnings that are very uh, digestible and um, kind of pragmatic in many ways. So I, I enjoyed the book. I'm really looking forward to, to talking to him about it. And uh, at this moment in time I'd really like to welcome Steve Case, the uh, chairman of Revolution Growth, a uh, investment firm based in Washington, D.C., a fellow board member at Revolution Foods, and uh, all around uh, inspiring guy. Steve, are you there? Can I you am. Ask? Well, we'll turn on your video, and there you come, and then we'll ask Lisa to, there we go. Hi, Steve. How are you today? Hi, how are you doing? I'm doing Good. well, Well. You, with all of the, your um, accomplishments, not many people know that you were actually the director of uh, pizza, new pizza development at Pizza Hut. That was probably the beginning of. Hey, how about that? Great, yeah, that was early in your in your livelihood. But something about food must have stuck, huh? Well, it was it was in the early '80s. I graduated from college in 1980, and as you mentioned, in, in, I talked about the book, The Third Way, but. I was interested back then in the idea of the internet, but when I graduated from college, there, the internet didn't really exist, so I couldn't really join internet companies, uh, and there wasn't much of a startup culture back then, uh, so I couldn't do my own thing, and so I decided to work for some big companies, work for Procter & Gamble uh, in Cincinnati for a couple of years, and then moved to Wichita, Kansas to work for Pizza Hut, which at the time was owned by PepsiCo, so it was a it was you know learning a lot about you know kind of the corporate world, learning a lot about marketing and, and things like that. Uh, but it, actually, I really enjoyed the, the year I had at uh, at Pizza. You you um, talk about really being having this entrepreneurial zeal at such an early age. You were organizing people, starting companies. It was almost like genetic. You know, it was interesting because I talked to Neil Grimmer just recently on this same program, and he said. He never, you know, thought of himself as an entrepreneur. He was just sort of an accidental. But reading your book, you sort of immediately identified with that role. Do you think it's something that you're kind of given, or is it something that you learn, or is it a little of both? I think it's a mix. I, I've met some people who, you know, were entrepreneurs from an early age, and then some who ended up uh, kind of. You know, becoming entrepreneurial much later in life. So I think it, it, my experience, it's a, it's a mix. My parents actually were not particularly entrepreneurial. My father was a lawyer. My mom was a teacher. So they were, they were, they were not kind of focused on that. But my grandfather actually ran a, a general store on the, on the island of, a uh, big island in Hawaii, a little town called Hilo. He ran that general store. So maybe I got some of that entrepreneurial genetics from, from him. But I was just curious about business and, and, you know, starting things and, you know, all the things I did when I was young were, pretty modest and I'm more particularly successful, but I learned some things. I was just intrigued with the idea of, of creating things and, and, and building things. And obviously as I you know, got older and, and, you know, kind of college and then in my twenties, I became much more of a, of the focus. Well, 
Well, today I'd love to um, take some of your experience and kind of look at the realms of technology entrepreneurship and food entrepreneurship and maybe see where we can draw out some similarities and some distinctions. One of the stories that I enjoyed in your book was about how you were sort of, you started one company and then you kind of morphed it. I mean, we'd probably use the word pivot now, but back then, we I don't think in the 80s we used the word pivot. I but, but you evolved it. You quickly sort of seized on that. No, that's more recent. That's what to do was different than, than what was needed. And maybe talk a little bit about that um, just in the context. Because I, I now hear that I hear the term pivot all the time. And I just get sometimes with food companies, I get a little worried about the ability to pivot as quickly as some people do in technology. So I'd love I'd love to just get your view on that. Yeah, no, my my experience when we got started with AOL, uh, it was 1985, and back then only three percent of people were online, uh, and they were only online one hour a week. So it was pretty early days, and we wanted to get America online. And you know, we were a little company not too far from here in the Washington D.C. area. We weren't able to raise much capital. We our first round of venture capital was one million dollars, and you know, it took a while to raise that amount of money. So we didn't have a lot of money to to invest, and we had to figure out kind of clever, creative ways to survive, let alone thrive. And one of them was to do strategic partnerships. And so in the in the mid '80s, uh, you know, personal computers were just coming on the scene. Home computers. Uh, one of the most popular ones back then in the mid 80s was something called the Commodore 64. And so we started out basically creating an a online service for the Commodore 64 that was customized just to work on that computer and we did it in partnership with, with Commodore. And then we did one with you know, Tandy at you know, Radio Shack, which was very popular at the time with, with personal computers. We created something for them called PC Link and then did something with IBM called the Promenade that did something with Apple called Apple Link personal edition. So for the first five years or so, that was really what we were doing. We essentially these private label, what some call white label, you know, online services. Uh, but after about five years of that, we realized we needed to change. We needed to pivot in part because Apple as one of our big partners decided they didn't really want to be partners. They, they'd rather, rather than have a, a licensing agreement with us where we had the license to use the Apple brand name and kind of ran the service ourselves. They really wanted to bring it in house, so that kind of forced us. We no longer call it, call it Apple Inc. Personal Edition. That forced us to take a step back and rethink our strategy, and that led to relaunching it as America Online and, and, and combining those various services together. So it was an example of, you know, as you said, what's now called a, a pivot. We started out in one one direction, and then you know some circumstances changed, and we had to move in a in a in a different direction. I think having Companies have the flexibility to do that, whether they're small startups or large Fortune 500 companies, uh, is important because the world's constantly changing and agility, and, and, and you know, does matter. Uh, but it's more complicated when you have more scale, and it's more complicated in, in some businesses as opposed to other businesses. And also, I think sometimes it's one thing to pivot because you have some momentum and you see a new opportunity emerging and you want to capitalize on that op opportunity. It's another, if what you're doing basically is failing and you say, well, that's not working, we got to try something else. And obviously it's better if you have some momentum and just see a path to accelerate that momentum, you know, that, that kind of pivot is obviously easier to make than one where you're essentially saying, we thought we we're going to do this and now we're going to do that. And it's sort of a, sometimes a, you know, a 180 degree kind of, you know, kind of swing. That's an excellent distinction to make because I do think that as we've promoted kind of entrepreneurial education and the persona of entrepreneur as hero or celebrity, um, I find sometimes even in my uh, MBA courses that um, people just sort of keep going and keep pivoting. They think they're gonna do that till they get it right, but they're frankly kind of in a failure mode and they're not adequately right. assessing what it takes to be successful. And and usually you know, they run out of money. You know, the, the, the issue of you know the, you have the luxury of a pivot only if you have enough capital to basically say okay well that didn't work you know well, we're going to do this instead or we're going to change our, our our strategy. For most entrepreneurs with most companies in most parts of the country, 
that really is not an option. What they're not doing is, 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 is what they started doing is, is failing. You know, sometimes it's hard to, to recover from that. So having the flexibility to, to change you know, your direction, to pivot, if you will, is, is great when you have it. But better to get it right the first time. That's right. Well, I, as I said in your introduction, I really enjoyed your book. And um, I don't say that about every book. It's not easy to write a book. Um, you, you certainly have learned that in the process. But I, I think you did such a nice job of kind of just armchair storytelling. It was kind of like hanging out with you and hearing your stories. But also, you know, I think you framed um, kind of key learnings in a way that were really, you know, digestible and, and um, you know, pragmatic and applicable. One, one story I love is, as you mentioned in this Apple scenario, you talk about moving to San Francisco you go to Apple every day for six months, you show up on their doorstep, you're kind of head of BD, you're head of everything, and you know that your future is dependent on this, uh, this deal. And, and that shows up as really one of your three Ps um, that you talk about, perseverance. And um, how did you, do you uh, remember like, what was it like when you thought, I just need to give up and find another path or were you just not gonna take no for an answer? at that point well we we, we uh, as i talked about in the book by the way, thanks for those comments and you know coincidentally this morning i was finalizing the edits for the paperback version of it that comes out in april we're adding some more you know kind of stories to it and added a new chapter kind of post-election you know kind of some some observations so it's uh even though i wrote the, the hardback version uh by, a little over a year ago, I was just, you know, in the last few days finalizing the, the, the paperback edition. So if you have any comments of things that you thought were unclear, you, you know, let us know. We're, we're still finalizing that. Uh, but in terms of my own journey, as I, as I described, uh, I early on believed in the idea of the Internet, the idea of a, of a connected world. Uh, but I was surprised by how hard it was. It really took us more than a decade before we kind of broke through and got traction. And it was a struggle and there were times where you know I ran out of money and had to lay people off and thought the company wasn't going to make it there definitely were times where I did calls from my parents and others saying you know it doesn't seem like it's working so well you know maybe it's maybe you should be thinking about like a plan b you know go, go get a real job you know kind of thing and so yeah I, having witnessed that I, I, I'm I'm sympathetic I guess empathetic to you know entrepreneurs who are trying to do bold things they are trying to take on you know systemic problems they are trying to change the world uh, and it's going to take a while it's going you know, they're, they're, they're particularly in you know with this coming third wave including in as you know in the in the in the in the food industry uh, I think they're going to be far more of the 10 year in the making overnight sensations as opposed to the overnight sensations and so being able to take that long view really be passionate about your idea have a assemble a team that really, you know, sticks with it, you know, through thick and thin and, and you know, kind of takes a long view, I think is going to be increasingly important. And frankly, in the second wave, the last decade or so, there have been so many overnight successes, true overnight successes, uh, that really has kind of changed the way people think about entrepreneurship, something like, uh, you know, Facebook and the dorm at Harvard or Snapchat, the dorm at and, and Stanford, and a couple of years later, there are these, you know, overnight phenomenons and, and you know, global successes. It's great when that happens, but that's actually pretty rare. It's much more common, you know, the, the journey we had where we just kept at it, you know, two steps forward, one step back, sometimes two steps forward, three steps back. We just, you just figured out a way to keep moving forward. And finally, you know, things broke. And in retrospect, I, it's easy for, even though I was frustrated at the time, I was kind of confused at the time, why, why it was so hard. Uh, in retrospect, I, I, I can look back and see why it was so hard. When we got started, the reason only 3% of people were online as most people didn't have personal computers, which you needed to get online. Of the people who had personal computers, most didn't have a communications modem. The modem was viewed as a peripheral device back then, not a central device. If you had a PC and a modem, you still needed communication software to get on, which was kind of complicated to, to, to figure out. And if you then got on and wanted to connect to one of these commercial online services, CompuServe or the Source or, or the Well or, or, or others, you know, sometimes it was $10 an hour to be connected. So that was sort of intimidating and if you actually got, you know were able to do that and you know got through all the stuff and got online and could afford to pay for it there wasn't much to do and there was nobody to talk to it was it was still you know kind of the early days so in retrospect it's, it, it's sort of more obvious to me why it took so long we just had to 
you know, get PCs into more home. We had to build modems into PCs, so it was a standard, not peripheral. We had to get the communications from dollars an hour to pennies an hour. We had to, you know, partner with content companies to have interesting, credible content online. We had to get enough people online, so there was a you know, online community, a sense of of community, and that just took time. And I think that's going to be the dynamic, the experience we had in you know that first wave of of the internet, trying to build the on ramps, educate people, kind of get everybody online, it's going to be, I think, some of the dynamics we'll see more in the third wave, including in, 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 the, in the food sector. And in the third wave, you talk a lot about the importance of um, being able to navigate policy. I imagine the new edition of the book takes into account that we're in a whole new policy environment. We may be in a 3.5 or 4.0 wave now that we weren't anticipating. So I'm really eager. We, you and I haven't even had a chance to talk about this, but I'm, I'm really interested in your thoughts. You're certainly a person that has worked very hard to develop um, broad relationships across a lot of different sectors and, and specifically in government and really working with entrepreneurs to get the kinds of resources and support available to them. Um, what are your thoughts now? I mean, particularly in food, just maybe a little background, what I've been working on. I've been kind of trying to inventory the different ways that the new president's policies could impact food in particular, and they are abundant. You know, everything from, right. uh, well, one starting with is just lack of interest in open information. Just yesterday, um, the animal welfare database was deleted from the USDA website. And for people that are doing research or care about different farming practices, you know, this is kind of pretty abrupt sort of change of um, policy or approach. Um, immigration, certainly um, tariff, trade tariffs could raise prices on food pretty significantly. So just maybe some advice of how should entrepreneurs, how should CEOs, how should investors be thinking about navigating in such a new world of uncertainty? Well, I think it's probably two parts. One is the general trajectory of, of how innovation, I think, will be changing in the next decade, and in, including in the food sector and why policy will become more important than, you know, maybe some specific thoughts on, on where things stand right now with the you know, the Trump administration. And in general, and it's obviously one of the themes of, of, of the book, that the last decade in innovation, particularly around the internet, was mostly about software, was mostly about apps. Because in that first wave, the focus was on building the on-ramps. The second wave was really building apps on top of the internet. And so it was, you know, Facebook and Twitter and Snapchat and Waze and, and, and so forth. Uh, and those applications uh, really didn't have a lot of policy implications. The first wave did. What, are, what is the communications policy, for example? Even when we started, people can't believe this, but when we started AOL in 1985, it was illegal for consumers to, or businesses to connect to the internet. It was restricted back then to educational use and government use. It, you know, the, the Congress had to pass a law to commercialize the internet. They had to break up the phone company to create competition in the internet. There are a bunch of policy issues in that first wave. They really weren't, you know, very common in the in the second wave until companies really got big and then there were privacy issues, things like that. But in the third wave, because the sectors that are going to be impacted are energy and transportation and 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 food and healthcare and education, pretty pretty fundamental parts of our, our lives, pretty big sectors of the economy and 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 generally regulated sectors of of the economy, the role of policy is going to become more important. So it's going to become more important for people who want to innovate in this next decade, in this third wave, to understand the role of policy, the role of regulation, which doesn't mean they'll necessarily like it because, you know, the regulatory environment often does slow down innovation. It does create some additional complexity, but I think it's just the reality of, of this of this third wave and the companies that figure that out and get in front of that and, and have policy as as part of their strategy are going to be helpful. The way I think about the first wave was really, particularly for an investor, the first wave was really about technology risk. Can you build it? That's what the investors were asking. You know, that sounds like an interesting pitch. Can you actually build it? So the, the venture risk, if you will, was technology risk. The second wave was more market risk. 
they knew you could build it because a lot, thousand people were building photo apps. Well, why were you going to break through and be Instagram or Snapchat or something? So it was more about market adoption. Therefore, you know, in the second way, market risk was the key. In this third way that's emerging, I think policy risk will be front and center and also partner risk. Many of these sectors will require a partnership. So in general, that's why, again, like it or not, I know a lot of people are like, oh, I don't really want to hear that kind of a kind of a bummer. I don't really want to have to deal with policy. I don't want to have to deal with government. Well, the reality is if you're dealing with food, you're dealing with health care, you're dealing with some of these sectors, you're going to have to factor that into your, your thinking. So that's the general kind of arc of what I think will happen in the in third way. In terms of the Trump administration, you know, it's early on. It's only been a few weeks. It has been, you know, chaotic. Some things that happened are, you know, so far are troubling, at least to, at least to me. Uh, but I think, that, you know, the real test will be the next few months when they kind of have people in place and priorities in place and, you know, kind of you know, get their sea legs and, and, and have a little more, you know, clarity. My guess is it'll be a mixed bag. There'll be some things that probably can be positive. Uh, and some things that you know might be uh, probably will be negative. On the negative side, you mentioned immigration; that is a is a concern and to me. I think we need to. I know we need to continue to win what's now a global battle for talent, and we should want to attract people to our country, uh, not be kind of you know trying to you know keep people out. That's not to say there aren't legitimate concerns about security and so forth. We need to we need to be sensitive about that. But in general, we need to make sure we are a magnet for uh, for for talent. Uh, so some of those areas are, are disconcerting. Yeah, taking a fresh approach to regulations, which uh, President Trump's talked about, and some some aspects that will be helpful. Some may be unhelpful. Some actually will be helpful. In some of these sectors, some of the regulations do slow down innovation, and maybe there's ways to you know speed it up. And you know, even a few months ago, uh, the end of the Obama administration, there was some legislation passed, for example, to try to you know, expedite the development of drugs and medical devices because it had been taking so long and it became so costly uh, that less investment was going into that sector and more of that innovation was happening in other countries around the world. So that was an example of, of trying to take a fresh approach to the regulations, maybe taking a fresh approach on taxes and investment incentives. So you know, innovators in different parts of the country, what we call the rise of the rest, the regions in the middle of the country in particular, maybe there's some incentives there. So. Uh, it's hard to say. It's 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 early days. To be candid, I do not support President Trump. I was concerned about you know some of the things he said in the campaign and, and the lack of specificity about some of his policies, particularly around you know technology and innovation. So uh, yeah, I share the concern a lot of people have about you know where we are and and where we're going. At the same time, having lived now in this Washington D.C. area for more than three decades and you know seeing things come and go, I, I think you know I'm hopeful that. As things settle down in the in the coming weeks and months, you know that we, some of the concerns on the downside might be mitigated, and, and some of the benefits might be uh, you know might be uh, uh, kind of uh, magnified. But we'll see. You know, we'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens. It certainly is kind of jump ball in terms of these sectors because everybody's trying to figure out what happens with with uh, with the new administration. Certainly, the long term approach and view is very prudent at this time for entrepreneurs, for investors. I think building things to last, as uh, Collins and Boris put it in their seminal book, you know, that's what we need to do. And I think in food, there's probably more opportunity than ever to um, you know, make a difference. You and I had weighed in on a couple of uh, editorials last year about the need to get clear on terminology and even priorities about where there are opportunities to um, innovate in, with food. Certainly, food is at the center of the plate with respect to human health, to planetary right. health and well-being. It's, it's really the topic that helps us understand really the interdependence of, um, of, of life and helps us understand that we do operate in kind of a biological system, not necessarily a technological or a mechanical one. So, uh, right. you know, I'm keen, that's, that's what's really drawn, you know, our efforts here at the Food Business School to try to map a lot of the best practices from innovation and entrepreneurship, but look at the specificities in food. Um, and so I'd love for you to talk just a little bit, you know, you've invested across the spectrum and you've invested in the healthcare space, clearly, you've invested in technology extensively, and now you're investing in food and you're invested in healthy food. And so maybe right. talk a little bit about that from your investment thesis perspective and what are you looking for and 
what do you think is going to going to win in the long term here? Well, I mean, as you said, it, you know, invest in firm revolution, invest in a lot of different different sectors. We've been around for a decade, done a lot of different things in, in a lot of different areas. And, and we like the diversity of that. We, we think that, you know, having a sometimes you learn things in one sector that can be applied to uh, another sector. And some of the general themes that we talked about around partnership and policy, we, we're finding are, are starting to you know come together, particularly in the in the third wave. So we're not, you know, kind of food investors per se. We're we're more investors in in a variety of, 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 of companies. Lost Steve there for a minute. Um, hopefully he'll be back with us. I think we're having a lot of um, uh, internet issues today, actually, ironically, with one of the inventors of the, um, <laughs> there he is, he's back. Okay. Hey, Good we're job. back. Maybe we're using a dial-up modem here. Maybe, maybe we're using a dial-up modem. Maybe we need to move to, like, I hear this concept called broadband. Maybe we need to install some higher speed access here. I called the FCC while you were away to get you your own dedicated fiber optic cable. Thank you. Really, really, really do appreciate that. So I, I just I, I don't know exactly when I got cut up, but I was uh, talking about how Revolution invests in a lot of different uh, sectors and food has become of interest, particularly in the last three or four years. And part of you know, and obviously the people part of the school know, it's a it's a huge industry, five trillion dollars globally, that hasn't changed that much in the last half century. A lot of the brands that I grew up with are still popular brands today, uh, but seems ripe for change and in, in different kinds of products, different kinds of services, using different kinds of technologies, trying out different kinds of business models. Just feels like there's a lot of opportunity in that. In that space, so we've made a you know a number of investments. Obviously, one that we've worked together on is Revolution Foods. Is, 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 you know the story better than I. You know, it started over a decade ago. It was really focused on how do we make sure when our kids go to school they have healthier school lunches. Um, and the two founders from uh, you know Berkeley basically have you know taken that idea and turned it into a pretty significant you know company that reaches a lot of kids and you know serves you know. Kind of those, coming up on 200 million meals so far and you know this is this is really kind of a uh, starting to be a game changer in terms of what they're they're able to you know to, to, to do and you know we think it's just scratches the surface in terms of not just providing those healthy options at school but now increasingly also having consumer products available in supermarkets Safeway and and many others so that was an example of taking on a big sector the the school lunch business in the United States alone is about a 16 billion dollar business how you bring a new approach, new innovation, that entrepreneurial spirit to that sector, and then how do you supplement that with a consumer you know, products uh, you know, business? Another one we've invested in, started in this Washington D.C. area, uh, is a company called Sweet Green, a kind of a fast, casual, you know, seasonal kitchen, you know, concept. It, it went from D.C. to Philadelphia to Boston, New York to Los Angeles to San Francisco to Chicago, so it's starting to expand you know, nationally, and we think it's really starting to emerge as one of the next generation. Brands, you know, fast casual is eating away at fast food, which is why you know McDonald's and some of those providers are, are under some pressure. A whole new generation of new brands, new entrepreneurs are creating new offerings and 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 healthier offerings. So we think those kind of businesses you know, have a lot of uh, like. We've also invested in some more technology oriented businesses. One you know, started in Baltimore called Order Up, a kind of a delivery operation for particularly second and third tier cities that ended up getting acquired by Groupon. So now that's part of of Groupon. So we're just looking at the sector saying, you know, here's where it is, here's where we think it's going, what what are some of the ideas, some of the trends that, that might be interesting to focus on, and then what are some of the, you know, who are some of the great entrepreneurs to back that can really capitalize on on, on those trends, and that will uh, continue to be our, our focus. One of the things I've really appreciated um, getting to sit across the board table with you is is how you support entrepreneurs and not every entrepreneur makes a good investor <laughs> and not every investor is an entrepreneur um, a lot of them started that way but i've been you know really impressed with the way you have focused on facilitating partnerships um, helping to attract talent you know both to the team and the board these are really important responsibilities of, of board members and to um you know, be thoughtful and um, I would say, you know, 
specific and timely about when you give advice. I, I always appreciate that, you know, when you speak up at the board table, you have something really salient to say. So um, I just like, I, that's not oh, the case I, in every board that I've been on, <laughs> but maybe you oh, can talk you a little bit about being a good board member. Yeah, I think it, it obviously it varies depending on where the company is, what the challenges are. We have some, you know, when it's an earlier stage startup and it's just kind of getting going, there's you know, obviously a lot more questions. And when it's a later stage, we call speed up like a Revolution Foods where it already has some scale. You know, there's some there's some different challenges. But I think it's important for any any investor, any board member to try to be constructive and try to be helpful and 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 you know be a sounding board. Uh, but you know the CEOs and the teams running businesses—they're busy and they've got a lot of things on their their plate. And so, how do you help them accomplish their goals, whether it be around partnerships or around you know hiring people for their team? So you are additive to that process, as opposed to kind of kind of you know throwing a lot of different you know ideas on the table that might kind of take them off track. So there's always a good it you know, needs to be a good dynamic with the management team and the board talking about things and making sure things are on on the right trajectory, but I think it's important for anybody who's trying to be supportive of, of, of entrepreneurs and management teams to actually be supportive of them. And that means trying to understand what are the one or two or three things that really matter most and how can you kind of be helpful there in, 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 in a constructive way and, and, and not get in the way, not, you know, not, not be kibitzing on you know, too many issues, but focus on a, a handful of things that really matter and, and try to try to be a constructive uh, you know, force. I, I think having Kind of been the been the entrepreneur, been the CEO, taking a company from you know, startup. When we got started, we had a couple dozen people. The peak, uh, you know, we merged with Time Warner. I think we were up to about ten thousand people. So yeah, I, I, I saw that journey and saw so, you know firsthand some of the challenges that that uh, entrepreneurs, CEOs have in, in building the, these these businesses, and did appreciate the, you know when we we had a very uh, strong board at AOL, and they they were helpful where they you know could be helpful, but also respectful of the fact that that the team had a lot on their plate and and uh, for the most part you know, we're trying to figure out a way to help accomplish those those objectives accomplish those goals as opposed to create more swirl and noise uh, at a time where companies you know, have their hands full just dealing with growth um, Nate, you, you talked a little bit about large markets that are ripe for change and disruption as being one of the frames that you and your partners use to look for investments. What what else do you look for um, when you're surveying investment options? I imagine you look at a lot of companies relative to the number of investments that you make. Maybe you could help the entrepreneurs yeah, really understand a little more about that. Well, it's a mix of things. It's from for our, from us. It, it sort of we have some strategic themes that we're interested in, you know, for example, food. And so we're kind of particularly interested in looking at things there. And as over time, people know that. And so as a result, we, we see more things in that sector. We also, because we've been doing this for decades and have a pretty broad network of investors and entrepreneurs, we can get a lot of things over the, the transom that just kind of, you know, kind of come at us in a whole variety of different areas and in different sectors. And we also spend a lot of time on regional entrepreneurship, what we, what we call the rise of the rest and trying to spend time in the middle of the country and meeting entrepreneurs in the middle of the country, do what we can to support the entrepreneurial communities in the middle of the country. And so we also see a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, and bump into a lot of ideas, you know, that way. So it's a mix of kind of proactive, strategic kind of a focus, kind of more reactive network, you know, kind of, uh, you know, kind of things as well as a, a kind of a, you know, proactive focus on trying to be helpful in these regions. As a result, we, you know, we do see lots and lots of things and, and you know, we're grateful to have the opportunity to meet so many great entrepreneurs in so many great places, doing so many interesting things across so many different different sectors. And we just have to figure out which are the ones that we really should hone in on, which are the businesses that we really do believe have the potential uh, to scale and which are the ones where we think we can be helpful. And, and, and you mentioned uh, some of the, the, the P's we talked about in the, in the book, like partnership, the company who are strategic partnerships are going to be important, maybe even transformative, and we probably can be more helpful than if they don't need partners. You know, businesses where issues around policy are likely to become more important, we probably can be more helpful. There are no policy issues, you know, it, you know, less so. So we just look for the opportunities where we really believe in the businesses, believe in the entrepreneur and the management you know, team, 
uh, and believe that there's you know, a way we can likely you know, help help uh, help them uh, kind of achieve their their goal, their dream, maybe a little faster because we're involved than they might have otherwise. Also in the book, Steve, you mentioned impact investing is kind of a new theme that's emerging and something that has come into your world really in multiple doors, both through the Revolution Fund and then also through your family's foundation where you're looking at um, opportunities to deploy philanthropic capital in ways that are going to generate you know, meaningful and measurable impact in the world. How that's kind of a neat, you know, um, structure that you've got. It's a bit unusual. Uh, I'm just interested in how you're what what you're learning about that and how you sort of sort through the priorities and you know what fits the fund, what fits the foundation. Is there are there opportunities where they come together? How does that work for um, Steve Case? Well, the, the foundation, really led by my wife, Gina, who runs the, the Case Foundation, has really been an advocate of the, of the concept of impact investing. How do you give that more visibility, more lift? How do you get more people understanding why it's growing in importance? How do you help weigh in on, on policy issues around you know, regulation so more capital can, can get freed up to move into impact investing? How do you educate foundations why perhaps some of their investment dollars should go into more impact focused companies, particularly in their in their sector. How do you educate people that are in the in the investment world what what's happening in this in impact space? And we just believe that that there's a growing generation of people, uh, particularly young people, but also others as well, that really are fixated in, in, on not just focusing on profit, but also focusing on a purpose and wanting to make sure they have a measurable impact. And, and Revolution Foods, again, is a good example. We, it's obviously a great business, a profitable business. It'll be an increasingly valuable business, but they're also focused on the impact, the purpose they can have around healthier meals, around job creation and, 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 and things like that. So clearly there is a, a, a sea change underway. And this challenges some of the assumptions economists have made, Milton Friedman, for example, Economist from uh, Chicago half a century ago, you know, said business should focus exclusively on profit. Any other, anything else is really a distraction that will, uh, you know, kind of impede the ability of business's ability to be you know, successful. I think that while still a lot of people have that view, I think there's a, a growing view that taking this broader, you know, kind of having a broader lens is going to be helpful. And in fact, these impact companies, because of their focus on purpose, because of their focus on impact, actually can end up being more successful and more valuable uh, as part of that. We saw that one of the companies we met when we were doing one of these Rise of the Rest bus tours in, in Detroit uh, was Shinola, which basically you know, started as a watch company, now they've expanded in other, other areas. But part of the purpose of that company was to create jobs in Detroit, a city that was struggling, and to prove that man manufacturing of luxury goods could happen in the United States. And, you know, and so they really started out with that idea. And part of the reason people buy, buy and wear a Shinola watch is they love the, the story around Detroit, around kind of, you know, kind of, kind of uh, built in Detroit, built in, in America. So that impact focus actually has helped fuel the growth of that, of that company. So that's how we think about you know, impact in, in general. And the foundation takes the lead on really trying to be an evangelist, if you will, for the, the cause of impact investing, get more people focused on that. And then Revolution takes the lead on making investments in, 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 in companies. And in the food industry, um, we're seeing really a concentration of mission-driven companies where it's the mission that creates a durable relationship with a customer that's grounded in belief and truth and trust, of course. And so, you know, I think in our sector, this becomes critically important, even more so than in, in, in other companies. And it permeates the culture. You've seen this sort of inside and out. It, it extends the, um, the brand identity and, um, you know, it, it ultimately becomes a source of competitive advantage, but it can't really be manufactured. It's real. Right. Right. No, no, no question. It, it sort of the, the, and that's you know, the, the original idea, the founding 
backstory, if you will, of, 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 of the startups is important. You know, the, the, generally, the ones that are successful start with somebody just believing they can solve that particular problem better. There's a there's a better solution. There's a better product. There's a better service. There's a better way. There's a better something, and they're passionate about that. And they assemble a, a team of people who, you know, share that passion, and then they and they have that kind of pioneering anything is possible kind of spirit and infusing companies with that passion and, and integrating in the culture that sense of a purpose a mission uh, i think is is critically important and ultimately those are the companies that succeed because most companies goes back to what we we're talking about earlier you know are not a straight line to success they you know there's some ups and some downs and and having that passion having that purpose having that that team that really kind of shares that conviction about what they're doing gets you through those tough times uh, and also it's what it, in the long run ends up animating potential customers and allies constituencies to want to be part of that journey part of that that mission and so it, it's it's it, it's it's always been the case i think it's becoming more and more in the case and will that will accelerate in, in this third wave and i think a lot of you know capital will start flowing into companies even there's a growing number of dedicated funds that are more impact related funds, a whole idea of benefit corporations, B corporations are relatively recent phenomenon. You know, the public benefit corporations are relatively recent phenomenon. I think that will just accelerate in the in the next decade. Well, Steve, in the last uh, question here, last few minutes, do you want to give us a little preview of the new chapter that you've added to the book, you know, post uh, November 2016 in this, do you have a new P for us or? Um, well, no. What, what we did, we, we added we added a bunch of things to different. We got a lot of feedback. Thankfully, the book did did well, sold well, and a lot of people read it and got a lot of feedback in terms of things that people wanted to hear more about or or or, or you know learn more about. And so we've added you know a lot to the core of it. But this yes, yeah, new chapter really are kind of reflections on the election and sort of some some areas to I think are merit some focus going forward. Uh, to try to make sure that we frankly remain the most innovative entrepreneurial nation in the world in a world where entrepreneurship is is globalizing and, and people have kind of figured out that the secret sauce that's kind of kind of helped power the American story is innovation uh, and entrepreneurship. And I started out by noting that while I was surprised by uh, the, the Donald Trump's victory, I wasn't completely shocked. Uh, because as I've been traveling around on these you know, bus tours in the last three years, I've, I've visited 26 cities in the middle of the country, uh, 6,000 miles, uh, and and you know, a lot of people I've met in those in those places do feel you know left behind. They do feel like a lot of the investment capital has gone to places like Silicon Valley or New York City or Boston, but actually not very much uh, to the middle of the country. And even last year, if you look at the you know, the, the data. Uh, if you add up all the states that Donald Trump won, I think it was 32 states, 33 states, and aggregate all those states last year, got 15% of venture capital, 1-5% of venture capital. Uh, and so, you know, if you're not investing in the entrepreneurs in Detroit and Des Moines and some other parts of the country, you're not then creating the jobs and, and opportunity in those places, then people do feel left behind because they are seeing the downside of some of the innovations happening in other places that are destroying jobs, whether it be artificial intelligence or robotics or driverless cars or automated factories or what have you, but they're not being offset by, by you know, innovations that create jobs in their, in their communities. So I think that it was one of the takeaways from the, you know, the election. I'm part of the, you know, the chapter is basically calling people to focus on leveling the playing field so anybody anywhere has a shot at the American dream. And in the process of backing entrepreneurs anywhere and, and you know, everywhere, we really can help drive the next wave of, of growth in, in, in communities all across the country and giving people that sense of, of hope. And so there's a number of aspects that, that you know, can we lay out that are kind of a framework to think about this and some priorities to set. But at the core, it's saying, you know, let's use this you know, as a little bit of a wake up call that right now we are not as inclusive in terms of entrepreneurship in this country as we'd like to be. It does matter where you live. It does matter what you look like. It does matter who you know. And this is this this problem is not just about, you know, the middle of the country and you know, the rise of the rest in place space. Last year, 90 percent of venture capital went to men, only 10 percent to 
women. About 1% went to African Americans, for example. So how do we make sure we have in this next third wave a more inclusive approach to innovation and entrepreneurship, and also, as we discussed, a more impactful approach to you know, entrepreneurship. And that's my hope is, is one, of the, one of the byproducts of this uh, election, even if you are surprised by the result or disappointed by the result or, or scared by the result, that maybe there's some, some takeaways here that can, can help us all kind of redouble our efforts to take the steps to be more inclusive, to be more impactful, to be more uh, interconnected and try to kind of make sure this next wave of entrepreneurship uh, it builds on what we've done in the past, but takes us in a, in a new direction. Well, I think that's a very inspired uh, and timely vision. And I really appreciate you sharing it. I'm just going to hold up your book. I'm going to encourage everybody to go get the hardback copy now because you got to read it now. And then when the paperback comes out, you can just look at what's changed. I think that'd be a good way to go. But um, Steve, it's great to spend time with you. We really appreciate your um, leadership. You've been like the team captain for entrepreneurs on the national level. And uh, we're grateful for all your good service and leadership. So thanks again for spending time with us today. Lose a connection on him. So I'm just gonna wrap up now. Um, Steve, we can, your team can take your webcam off and uh, I'm just going to wrap up and show one slide here. We've got another uh, Food Biz Plus seminar coming up on March 31st with Cheryl O'Loughlin, who is the founder of um, one of the co-founders of Plum Organics, which you've heard from recently, and she's now the CEO of Rebel. She's also got a new book called Killing It, an entrepreneur's guide to keeping your head without losing your heart. She is a soulful person and uh, a good friend and I think you'll really enjoy our conversation with her March 31st. So thanks again for joining our Food Biz Plus conversation and thanks again to Steve Case and uh, we're wishing you all well from the Food Business School at the Culinary Institute of America. Bye-bye.